So uh, why traffic management? So traffic management has existed in the ISP market for a long time. Um, this is obviously done because everybody wants to deliver great service to their customers. It's it's natural thing for ISPs to do. Um, and we've all had this experience of managing a backhaul link, uh, for example, at 80, 90%. It operates perfectly fine. It gets a little bit more traffic and all of a sudden all the customers are complaining. Or a home connection that one subscriber, one customer, or one person in the home, sorry, is doing Netflix, another one's doing gaming, everything's fine, another game starts, and all of a sudden everyone's complaining, nothing works. Or if you're doing plan enforcement on an access point, for example, once it hits a certain limit, everybody's complaining again. And fundamentally, this is all because of one thing. It's because links and the internet as a whole doesn't operate well when you're near link saturation. You get to this point where it's kind of that, that first dotted line there where everything's fine, until suddenly it's not. And the goal of traffic management has always been to kind of stay below that first dotted line, because again, if you don't, your customers are very unhappy. Um, there might be a, a more interesting question here, which I'm gonna circle back on, is, is why is this true? Why is it true that a full link has a crappy experience? And we're gonna come right back to that after we kind of go through the rest of the, the story here. So if we go back to traffic management all the way back to the beginning, um, 20, 2005, 2006-ish, um, the ISPs were really struggling with BitTorrent. Um, this was a time lots of people were getting on the internet for the first time, signing up customers like crazy. Um, BitTorrent came along and all of a sudden everyone was unhappy, right? The links were all full, the, you know, the cable modems were full, the backhauls were full, everyone was angry. Um, and I think kind of a, a natural, I'm sorry, and the reason is because when the links are full, the experience is bad. So even the people not using BitTorrent were unhappy. Um, and I think kind of a human nature thing happened here where People basically said, well, my network was working fine. I was signing up customers, everyone was happy. All of a sudden this thing happened, in this case it's BitTorrent. Now um, my customers are unhappy and my network's broken, so therefore the answer must be I need to control that new thing. I need to control BitTorrent, I need to control applications. A and this basically spawned a whole industry around application-specific traffic management. Um, the first versions of this would limit the number of connections, just to kind of like a rough approximation of how much traffic people could have. Um, and providers like this because it was offline, very simple. But in the end, this really is what started the whole net neutrality movement. This started the FCC versus Comcast lawsuits. Everything that we see downstream of the net neutrality all came out of this time with, with people generally trying to do the right thing, right? They were trying to give their customers a good experience, but it just happened in a way that everyone didn't necessarily agree with. So after the uh, offline solutions, everything kind of migrated to this more inline architecture, super abstractly here. Um, packets come in one side, you have some kind of DPI, inspection engine, matching engine to determine what application those, those protocol, or sorry, those packets are associated with. Then you have some kind of policy to choose what to do with that. If you wanna prioritize individual applications or sub applications, all that kind of stuff. And effectively, you can think of those first two boxes, the, the signatures, the policy, is kind of like a classifier telling the shapers what to do. Uh, over time, this got much, much more complicated. Very first versions of this was simple port matching. If it's port 80, give it high priority, everybody's happy. Didn't take long for the BitTorrent guys and everyone else to figure out if they also went to port 80, then they were getting, get, getting good service as well. So quickly migrated to signatures and complex heuristics and interflow correlation and machine learning and all kinds of stuff. And in general, that box has just gotten more and more complicated over time and unfortunately less and less accurate over time. Um, and the policy needed to express a good quality of experience got more complex too. Um, if you have to choose things like which chat protocols to prioritize, prioritize over others, which video protocols, I've seen policy files in big networks of thousands of lines of conditions to try to achieve a good quality of experience. It's really a lot of work to manage this stuff. And again, it's really all just a classifier down to the shaping side. A, a, a couple of examples of this, um, once you have a lot of control, you have a lot of decisions to make and, and a lot of the complexity. Uh, so if we take Netflix, for example, just the left-hand side there, just a super simple example. Uh, 4K Netflix today is about 25 megabits per second as a stream, uh, 720p is three megabits. So, and what's worse about this is it actually depends on the content because if it's a cartoon, it's much lower bit rate than if it's uh, Avengers or something like that. Um, and it also depends on the device playing because newer devices have better codecs, which have better compression than, than older devices. And unfortunately, you can't actually see any of those things anymore because of TLS, uh, which we'll come back to. 
But even without that, expressing conditions that would allow you to do, say something like, I want every customer to have one HD stream of Netflix as my quality of experience, it becomes very, very complicated to do this even within a single protocol or application like Netflix, let alone across a whole bunch of applications. Um, a similar thing happens if you want to try to manage a link, right? If you wanted to say, I want to give 40% of a particular link to Netflix, you don't really know if that 40% is giving everyone HD, giving everyone SD, giving one person HD and everyone else SD. It's really impossible to answer these questions. Um, on the right-hand side there, there's also this interesting problem of making choices that are usually right, but maybe not always right. So you could have a situation where, you, you, as an ISP, perfectly realistically, you want to manage um, Netflix and YouTube to have the best experience. You make some policy rules to do that. And that kind of comes with the implicit assumption that BitTorrent is lower priority to consumers than Netflix and YouTube. That's not necessarily true. Um, some people use BitTorrent for live streaming applications, especially some of the not so official ones. Um, and also people use, uh, people like um, Blizzard, for example, with some of their games use BitTorrent for update delivery. So if uh, someone's just started the game for the first time in a week, they want that update right away. And making a decision to prioritize BitTorrent in their case is actually the opposite of what they actually wanted. So it's forcing some decisions that, that may otherwise not be optimal or for not optimal for the subscriber. But nevertheless, this, this was all kind of possible, right? So at the start, it was easy to match traffic. It was easy to match it accurately to, to do useful things. That's decreased over time. And a big reason for that was Snowden. So everyone's probably aware he released a whole bunch of top secret documents um, that showed that there was a bunch of pervasive surveillance happening on the internet. Um, one of the cool things that comes out of that is this little picture in the bottom. Uh, basically, they recognized that people had TLS connections, SSL, from the web browser to Google's load balancer. But inside Google, between the data centers, they didn't encrypt anything. So what they did is they just tapped the fibers between the data centers. So after all this happened, uh, the whole tech community just said, this is crazy, we're going to encrypt everything. It doesn't matter how trivial it is, how basic, how unvaluable, we're going to encrypt everything from now on. Google did a whole bunch of work on the protocol side. Um, the IETF did as well. The IETF now has a section in their drafts where you have to say how this protocol is related, is protects against pervasive per surveillance, I think they say. So it's really something that everyone is taking super seriously in protocol design now. And out, uh, the outcome of that is some of the stuff in TLS 1.2, some of the security features in QUIC and HTTP 3. Um, but th the takeaway here is really that it's getting harder and harder to do this. It's not impossible. You can still do correlation across flows. You can still um, do some heuristics, some machine learning. But it's getting more and more difficult to all do this all the time. And it, it eventually is going to cross the threshold where it's, maybe it's not practical, which we'll get to. Um, so traffic's changing a lot, too. So th this kind of goes back to the same thing. Um, at the beginning, we, we used to write rules that would say, if it's a MPEG download, that means it's a video, you could shape that differently than if it was uh, HTML, because you wanted that interactive web performance. That worked in HTTP 1.0 without TLS because you could see the host headers, you could see the individual requests. As soon as you hit TLS, everything in red is gone. All you now know is that you have a connection to, in this case, mypics.com or facebook.com or what, whatever those things are. Um, so you're very limited, but you could still get some idea of what's going on. Certainly looking at the certificate name is still a really useful way to identify traffic today. Uh, but with HTTP2 and HTTP3, this gets even more difficult because you now have many logical connections inside a real connection. So one TCP flow with video and chat and the Facebook timeline and whatever else is potentially all living inside this one stream. So to even look at the behavior of one TCP flow and say, hey, I think that's probably video, I can manage it like video, actually becomes impossible in this situation. Um, and, and that's, I mean, there's a lot of traffic already that's quick and, and TCP. Google's predominantly quick already, which is basically like a TCB-like protocol over top of UDP. Um, and there's some other things which I won't talk too much about, like the encrypted certs, the encrypted SNI, which takes away that whole common name, certificate name thing. You can't even see that anymore. Um, and then some zero RTT, session resumption, super low-level geeky stuff. But this is all making it harder and harder to identify traffic. So when I think about what caused us to build uh, Perseem, it was in a big way seeing these two trends. So seeing this orange line where the, the amount of traffic that can accurately be identified, the utility associated with identifying that traffic was going down. 
and the difficulty of identifying that traffic was going up, and that's the red line. Um, there was a time at the beginning of traffic management where we heard from past lives, from customers about wanting to uh, charge per video and for YouTube separately from Facebook and all that stuff. Um, besides not being a great, necessarily a great business idea, technically it just wasn't practical. These things were, weren't accurate enough um, once the protocols started trying to hide themselves to, to make that possible. Um, and then after that, there's a threshold where it's still practical to do this type of management, but getting more difficult. So when we saw these two trends, we said these are going to intersect someday. I don't know if they intersected last year, if they're going to intersect today, or if they're going to intersect next year. But I think these two trends are, are pretty undeniable. It's harder to identify traffic, and the amount you can identify is going down. So we said there's a, there's an, uh, there's a real problem here of when this happens. But barring an alternative solution, what are you going to do about it? You still need to deliver a good quality of experience. You still need a solution to do that. And hence, the application specific traffic management really kind of kept going. And then, uh, oh sorry, and to back that up, so all this complexity again for what? We're, we're really, we've built these policy engines, we've built these application aware features, and we're doing it all because we want to stay below that first dotted line because otherwise just the experience gets really bad. What if instead of that, we could just figure out how to make the experience not get bad between those two dotted lines? And what's crazy is, is that actually happened. And, and we didn't do it, but someone else did. Um, in 2010, Jim Geddes coined this term buffer bloat. Um, this is a perfect case of marketing, by the way. Uh, Low-level network protocol people understood buffer bloat for a long time, but until it had a cool name, no one paid attention to it. So it's very important to have cool name for names for things. Um, but basically what buffer bloat is, is talking about the fact that when a link gets full, the buffers that are associated with that link get full, and that's where all this bad behavior comes from, that spike in latency, the spike in, in loss, all that stuff comes from that. Um, and once this was recognized, it created kind of a, a renaissance in active queue management technique development. So active queue management is basically a algorithms applied to protocol or to uh, packet buffers to deliver a really good experience. Uh, so there's some new things came out of that, CODL, PI, uh, you know, FQ CODL, it doesn't really matter for, for right now which ones are which, uh, but the net effect is this, uh, these things when applied to queues give you a great experience even under heavy load. And they solve that problem of that little gap that we were trying to fix with application-based traffic management. That's what the little chart in the middle there is trying to show that you know, latency, for example, stays flat under load. Um, anyone that's talked to us before has seen that little picture of the, the, the FQ cuddle thing. Um, that that's, happens to be the AQM we use. Uh, but in, in general, the thing to take away from this is AQM solves this problem. Uh, certainly, she talked to me, you've seen the picture. Yes, definitely. So, I mean, back to why, why we built Perceem Traffic Management. So, it was really seeing all these things happen at once. Again, the, the utility and the value of matching traffic going down, the complexity of matching it going up. And once these new techniques were available, and we didn't invent these, right? Like, these are techniques coming out of the IETF and research groups. This is like a freight train going by, and we grabbed it on the way by, right? There's some really cool stuff happening here that we've been able to take advantage of. Um, and, and once that happened, th the value associated with doing all these complex rules to try to figure out the perfect mix of protocols to deliver a great customer experience just, just basically disappeared. Th that doesn't mean there's not value in understanding what's happening on the network. They're still useful to understand longer term trends of where applications are going. Um, it's useful to have some of that information for support use cases, for example. But all those things can be, I think, better and more simply handled with an offline type solution where you're capturing and analyzing the traffic rather than bundling that into something that's inline and shaping packets and is, and is critical to your network. Uh, so that's kind of the, the whirlwind tour of, of where and how we started Perceem, was really seeing these trends and deciding we need to do this. Um, modern AQM t techniques really solve this problem. You don't need to have complex policies trying to balance all these changes on the internet and protocol pack updates that are as fast as Windows antivirus packs um, in terms of how often they update. To, you don't need to do any of those things to deliver a good experience anymore. You can have something that's much more hands-off and just does the job. And importantly for us is it means that we're not chasing these things. We're not trying to keep up with Netflix and trying to keep up with Skype and all that other stuff. We can spend our time focused on the measurement and the analytics side, which is where we think a lot of the, uh, the future value for the product comes from.